Uh, first and foremost, welcome to everybody. Thank you so much for joining on us uh, in the first of a three series uh, seminars, uh, talking about offshore wind and the issue of climate change. Climate change is real. I know that might be shocking uh, to some people, but probably not to anybody on this Zoom meeting. And New York honestly is leading the way uh, in America to address climate change. And one of the significant ways we're going to be doing that is through renewable energy and transitioning away from fossil fuels to renewables, offshore wind being a key player in that. Um, we have some very, very uh, lofty goals here in New York State that have been codified into law. You may or may not know, but the Climate Protection Act was passed uh, last year. That was last year. Yep, it's 2020. So, you know, we have some goals such as by the year 2030, 70% of our electricity uh, has to come from renewable energy. By the year 2040, zero emissions from all from the electricity sector. By 10 more years after that, in the year 2050, net zero carbon economy. 7,000, uh, I'm sorry, 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind to be installed by 2035 in only 15 years from now, and 6,000 megawatts of solar by 2025 in five years from now. That's a lot of renewables, it's a lot of work, and it's a lot of effort. So the question is, how are we going to do that? How will we get there? With all the answers today, we have our guests and our panelists, but I am delighted um, to welcome, we have uh, three speakers. Doreen Harris is the acting president and CEO of NYSERDA, New York State's uh, Energy Research and Development Agency. I have to do something I normally don't do here. I'm gonna put a plug in for NYSERDA and say it's really, and I don't want anybody to hang up right now, but it's a government agency that gets things done. And we're very uh, proud of the work that NYSERDA does. And we'll be hearing from Doreen on what is NYSERDA's role in implementing the goals that we just spoke about. We also have with us uh, Senator Todd Kaminsky. Senator Kaminsky has his region in Nassau County. He's the chair of the Senate, the Senate Environmental Conservation Committee. And I have to say, you know, working with both Senator Kaminsky and Assemblyman Engelbright is like working in a partnership. I've worked with a lot of Senate and Assembly member and con chairs. Um, but the last few years, and I'm not just saying that, it's really felt more like a partnership and a collaboration rather than a tug of war and going to the dentist to get your teeth drilled. So lastly, we have Senate, uh, Assemblyman Engelbright. Um, who's well known in the environmental arena. He's the only geologist uh, in elected office in the state of New York, and he brings his talents and his knowledge um, to us. And then after that, we're gonna have some questions and answers from you guys. I see there's already comments in the chat. Um, and to help field those questions and answers, we've asked two experts to join us. We have a Joe Martens, who's the director of the New York Offshore Wind Alliance. And we have Julie Tai, who's the executive director of the New York League of Conservation Voters. So with no, oh, and so we're asking everyone to stay on mute. You know, it's not a free for all. We have 60 to 70 folks um, join, who have already joined. So, um, but please, you know, raise your hand. Um, we, we want you to put questions in the chat. We want you to raise your hand. We will be calling on you. You can ask your question. We just wanna do it in an organized manner. So Doreen Harris, from NYSERDA. Um, Hannah, can you unmute Doreen so that she can tell us the wonderful things NYSERDA is doing and how we're gonna get to that zero carbon emissions in New York State? Sure, um, can everyone, can you hear me, Adrian? Yeah, great, um, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to, to speak with all of you today and also, um, to be um, sharing the virtual stage with um, assembly member Engelbright and Senator Kaminsky, nice to see you again. So thank you for having me. And um, I want everyone to notice that my backdrop always has a wind turbine. So for what it's worth, um, uh, it is, it is um, the case that we at NYSERDA are, are working hard to implement Governor Cuomo's um, goals for us as a state you mentioned all of the headlines numbers that 
are really part of the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act that I know we'll be speaking about today. But in my view, and just most generally, um, when that was signed, when that act was signed into law, it was a real game changer for the way I think about our work at NYSERDA. Because Adrian, you're absolutely right. I like to get things done. I, I like to execute and I like to see um, change. Um, I'm very impatient <laughs> and I like to see change um, perhaps not as fast uh, as Joseph would like in the, in the Zoom chat, but, uh, but I certainly like to see change. And I think, um, I think for me, you know, the, we already had what is an amazing climate law in my view and, and really kudos to all of you and everyone for getting that through and passed. It sets the stage, I think, for a perfect framework for us as where we sit as a state in 2020. Um, who would have known, right, that we would be at a point of such an intersection of a climate crisis, an economic crisis, and a health crisis layered on top of a huge issue of social justice and equity, that um, that lo the law very much um, takes all of those issues head on and sets forth a framework that can really be built in a way that addresses those issues simultaneously. So when we do our work at NYSERDA, um, we think about all of these issues together. And, and it's really not just a number that we think about, it's the broader benefits that will come to our state, um, economically, environmentally, and socially, for sure, that we are now um, beginning to realize in a year when we very much need that good news. So, so our job at NYSERDA, just very briefly, is to implement. Um, we implement programs in fulfillment of these goals and um, notably have been working for a long time to realize the nine gigawatt offshore wind goal that you um, referenced and that I think is the focal point for this discussion. But um, we certainly have many, many other objectives that we're looking to hit, um, including the 70% by 2030 and the 100% by 2040 objectives um, that you referenced, Adrian. And so when we think about actually achieving these goals, um, we do so um, by actively establishing the preconditions for these benefits to come to our state. And we've been doing that in the case of offshore wind for, oh gosh, five, six years now. Um, it's really, really rewarding um, and very, very um, impressive to see the support of all of the folks on today's um, uh, Zoom call, but in general across the state for many years as this moment has, has come upon us in which we have um, this exciting combination of projects of jobs of benefits all coming our way in a very real way today. So we do have um, three offshore wind projects that are under contract with the state of New York, um, one with LIPA, two with NYSERDA, um, totaling over 1800 megawatts of capacity. So part of what we get to talk about now is projects. Um, how are they proceeding? What are the challenges associated with them? And what investments are they making in our state as a result of our commitment to the resource at large? But 1800 megawatts is just the beginning. Um, we're in the midst of our second solicitation um, for offshore wind. Um, we are wrapping that up now and in general are strongly committed to continuing that march um, toward realizing our goals. What's really interesting in 2020 though is that we are able to combine our objectives to uh, benefit from renewable generation with a benefit um, coming to our ports. Um, so we've also um, included a $200 million commitment from the state for port infrastructure investments this year that will allow us not only to see those, uh, the, you know, the benefits of renewable generation, but also really important infrastructure investments that will bring supply chain and other activities to our state as well. And so when we think about where we are today, it's largely the result of these many years of work we put in together to create this foundation of support, this understanding of the resource and the broad articulation of the opportunity for us um, together. 
I think it's, um, it's testament that we now have 100 people on a webinar who actually are interested and know about offshore wind, who understand where we are. And, and, that's, the re and that's the result of hard work um, over the last few years. But that work needs to continue as we see um, the challenges of particular projects and particular needs coming forward as well. So I'm happy to talk about offshore wind. I could talk about it all day. But I think we're at this moment um, where we see the investments from these companies and in our state really hitting the mark, the mark that I just described, the environmental mark, the economic mark, the social mark, um, the equity mark. Um, it's really, really exciting and critical to the achievement of our goals. So I'm happy to talk about any other renewable resource uh, that folks would, would wanna talk about today, solar, wind, any of the new items that we're implementing through the Climate Action Council, of which we have a meeting this afternoon. But uh, I just generally very much appreciate the time um, to join today and, and to speak a little bit about the work that we're doing at NYSERDA. Um, as I close, I'll just mention, I'm sorry to say, I have to drop at 1230, but my colleague Adrian Downey's on. Um, I'm sure if there's questions specific to NYSERDA, she can answer them too. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you. Can you just give folks a quick little summary of the projects that are moving and then you'll be making an announcement? I don't want to put words in your mouth. At some point this year or next year about additional projects? Sure. Yes. Um, so the three projects that are moving um, across the state, or well, not across the state, but in, in the New York Long Island area. The first is the um, South Fork Wind Farm, which is a, a smaller initial project of 130 megawatts under contract with the Long Island Power Authority. And that's being developed by a joint venture of Orsted and Eversource. Um, then we have the 880 megawatt Sunrise Wind Project that NYSERDA awarded in what was an amazing day in July of 2019. Uh, Adrian will, uh, and, and actually all of the speakers will uh, remember that day <laughs> clearly as uh, we had a lovely event signing the CLCPA and announcing the Sunrise Wind Project, which is an 880 megawatt project also developed by Orsted and Eversource. And then rounding us out is an 816 megawatt uh, project being developed by Equinor from uh, Norway. Uh, known as the Empire Wind uh, Project. So those are the three projects that are actively moving forward in the state, but there's a huge market interest in our state because of our goals and the seri seriousness thereof due to the codification of that goal in the CLCPA. And so we're in the midst of our next solicitation as we speak. We took the bids in this fall, and as per usual, um, they were impressive and responsive to what was a fairly complex request, which it was we basically want it all. We want the best prices and the best projects um, all told and the industry certainly responded. So yes, we're sort of on the cusp uh, to, to get the, the word out with respect to the, resp um, the results of that RFP and, and very much looking forward to that day, um, given, given again how robust the response was in the first place. Do you have an estimate of timeline for us and for the um, participants? Yeah, no, I, I don't. I, I guess I, I'm going to have to go back to my 2019 phrase, um, soon. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> that will have to do. Yep, it will, but it's really exciting, so uh, worth waiting for. Okay. Well, thank you, and we will very much look forward to the, the announcement of the next uh proposals and next projects for offshore wind. Thank you for your work and your staff, uh, Doreen, as well, and for participating. Thank you. Okay, so next, let's hear from uh, Senator Todd Kaminsky on one of the authors of the climate uh, law. And um, actually, living on Long Island, you will have a lot of um, participation in offshore wind development. So how's it going and what should we do? Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, great to see everybody here today. Just want to thank Doreen for being a wonderful partner. And uh, Assemblyman Englebright and I try to uh, do everything together, knowing that we're far more powerful when we put our heads together than when we work separately. And I think we've used used our combination uh, effectively. And I, I hope we can continue to do so this, this uh, I was going to say semester, but th this session. <laughs> um, it does feel like going up to college sometimes, but without any of the fun. Um, let, let me um, let me just start by saying that um, 
I know we're talking to a lot of professionals who are in this business for a living. Um, so, I, you know, I would normally explain this differently to people who aren't familiar, but I'll, I'll be quick and then, you know, save, save some time for questions. The most important thing that I, I think we achieved and have tried to achieve is by really being able to channel the pent up demand for all the clean energy developers and to build a workforce um, in, in furtherance of that work. Um, there's far more demand than there are projects. I know um, NYSERDA is scrambling to get online, but you know the federal government has been worse than unhelpful in opening up new lease areas. Um, you know, a wind, uh, prominent wind developer once told me that they call the New York Bight the Saudi Arabia of wind. And this is probably one of the most fertile areas, I guess, to, uh, um, you know, in the country where wind energy can work. And we've got, you know, this, this great area for it. So we wanted a signal, Assemblyman Englebright and I really wanted a signal then New York is open for business. We are the ground floor. When, you know, eventually other states and God willing the federal government soon decide to come around and say, we want to do this too. We want them to look to New York for guidance, but not only from an architectural perspective, but literally where are the people that know how to, to do assembling, that know how to do transmission, that, that can work these jobs. Oh, talk to the men and women from New York who have already done this and who are a few steps ahead of everybody else. And we want to be on the ground floor of that green economy because we know that's the future and that's where it's going. Now, yes, these are very aggressive goals. And no, there's no one who could tell you step by step how to meet all of them. But we certainly know that we're not going to get anywhere without setting those aggressive goals and kind of unleashing our creativity and our energy and all our power toward reaching them. And we're confident that we could do that. Um, and we're, you know, we're, we're going to prove the doubters wrong. And there were plenty of doubters. You know, I don't know how. Um, this energy became a part, this uh, issue over energy became a partisan one, but it is. Um, just to remind everybody, the CLCPA, only two out of, I think, 24 Republicans in the Senate voted for it. Um, one Republican during debate said there was no need because an ice age was coming to worry about, uh, worry about global warming. That, that's a true story from a duly elected official. Um, so, you know, we, we have a, a lot of work to do. Now, the big question for us, and I know where Doreen's answer to this is, but the big question for the legislature is where do we fit in as the Climate Action Council continues to do its work? Do we sit on the sidelines and watch them, watch what we put into motion, or do we find areas where we think using legislation and other tools at our disposal, we could push things further um, to help a particular segment of, of the green economy move forward to uh, jumpstart an area to make rules more fair to direct that that things be distributed more fairly. I do think there is some role for the legislature going forward. We'll have to figure out what that balance is working with the council that we've put into place. Um, but I am confident we could continue to do great things, including in this upcoming session. So I'm excited for what we've done. I'm already seeing the fruits of that. Uh, and I look forward to taking your questions to see how we could work together to make New York's offshore wind um, sector the best in the country and continue to lead uh, on this planet. So thank you. Thanks for the time, Adrian. Thanks for doing this. Thanks, Senator. Appreciate it. Uh, next up, we have the infamous uh, Assemblyman Steve Engelbright. Assemblyman, got to unmute yourself. If I had a dollar every time I said that this year, I'd be a very wealthy woman. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to listen to Todd uh, and uh, to Doreen. Uh, you know, all of the comments are pointing in a positive direction. And this is at a time when uh, climate change uh, really threatens uh, the global ecosystem. And uh, for those of us in coastal New York, it threatens uh, to drown our coastlines, uh, the hottest parts of uh, of the earth right now in terms of climate change um, or north of the Arctic Circle. We have, uh, we have large parts of uh, uh, Siberia uh, on fire, burning uh, in the boreal forest, uh, only to be matched by uh, Brazilian uh, 
uh, Amazon uh, fires and California fires. Uh, this is uh, all very menacing and ominous. And so it is indeed a pleasure to, to have a chance to work with somebody of the, of the intellectual uh, and, and actuarial uh, capability of a Todd Kaminsky. So I salute you, Todd. Thank you for being such a, uh, a great leader and uh, a great partner. Um, I, I think most of the people on the call know uh, what uh, the CLCPA is all about. I don't think I need to go through all of that. Uh, but uh, I would like to uh, just mentioned that uh, I was uh, very pleased when the speaker appointed uh, Peter Iwanowicz. So from, from your advocate world, uh, uh, Adrian, uh, you have a colleague who's, who's on uh, the uh, Climate Action Council and two world-class scientists uh, Dr. Paul Shepton, the Dean of the School of Oceanic and Atmospheric Sciences and Marine Sciences at Stony Brook, and Dr. Robert Howarth of Cornell. Uh, and so uh, along with Eddie Bautista, who is uh, part of, of our array of appointments, I'm, I'm very pleased that we are seeing some, some really high quality appointments being made uh, by the speaker. Should also point out that the speaker uh, has just been enormously supportive, and uh, going forward with uh, our agenda uh, this year, I anticipate that uh, uh, we'll have continued cooperation between not only the Senate and Assembly, but at the leadership level as well. Uh, some of the things that I would like to point out uh, are worth discussing. Uh, some have been talked about a little bit here. Uh, the projects that have begun, Orsted is a part of two of those three projects. Uh, I'm very pleased that the Orsted Operations Center is going to be located uh, in the South Setauket area in my district. Um, they're going to be using Port Jefferson as their home port. They'll have a research vessel operating out of uh, that deep water port and uh, it is, of course, proximal to the, the uh, marine sciences study uh, and research uh, capabilities of Stony Brook just a mile away. Uh, so I think that suggests a long-term uh, relationship uh, that uh, has the potential to grow, uh, to grow and uh, have uh, the, the corporation literally investing into uh, our uh, communities and uh, and uh, uh, creating jobs and uh, recruiting uh, from uh, the best and brightest uh, of the uh, students at Stony Brook. Um, so I, I find that all very positive. Uh, I, I'd just like to, to uh, suggest that uh, some of the port infrastructure money uh, that uh, is being talked about, uh, you know, be destined for uh, Port Jefferson. I haven't heard yet whether that is the case, but I thought I'd just put in uh, the suggestion. Just some subtle lobbying on the part of the assemblyman. A little subtle lo lobbying. We're not so subtle lobbying. <laughs> Send your letters. We love the letters. Um, but they, they seem to be good corporate citizens. Uh, they certainly are uh, setting down their, their roots here in a very responsible way. So I, 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 I urge you to consider that, uh, Doreen. Um, you know, uh, some of the things that uh, I'd like to suggest we, we continue to, to look at is um, how to get the, the power most efficiently to market. We have uh, 
in today's Newsday, a big story about uh, uh, the several options uh, that uh, the Long Island Power Authority is looking at uh, for reorganization. Uh, they're an important partner uh, because the infrastructure, if you bring the power from uh, the eastern end of the island uh, in toward the city, the uh, power line infrastructure is just not adequate at the moment to carry the power. We don't have yet um, all of the plans worked out for how to not only deliver it to market, but transmit it from uh, DC to AC. I know that's all being worked on, um, but uh, as that unfolds, the scale of, uh, of, of uh, what is invested into in terms of uh, power line uh, uh, upgrades uh, really needs to anticipate the continued demand for new projects. And uh, certainly uh, we, 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 we built the whole system so that the power lines got smaller as they went east and now have to get uh, bigger from the east and uh, uh, almost reverse the, the, the uh, uh, magnitude of uh, uh, the uh, power transmission uh, because the new power source is offshore. Uh, a large part of it is we have six gigawatts, of course, of uh, photovoltaic solar generation that's required in this CLCPA. Uh, we have a significant three gigawatt uh, target for ener energy storage. All right, well, Assemblyman, I just want to jump in. I, I think you're getting into some very important issues, but very detailed. And forget, don't forget, this is for a general public. Um, no. Those are some, uh, some very specific details. I'm not sure everyone's going to be able to, you know, digest. Well, um, that's why we set up uh, the Climate Action Council, quite yep. frankly. Um, so your, your point's well taken. And uh, those experts uh, that have been appointed uh, are going to be meeting this afternoon. They have been meeting. And uh, as, as Todd correctly pointed out, uh, we're going to be relying upon them, but we're also going to stay involved ourselves uh, to see if there are ways uh, legislatively to uh, refine uh, and improve uh, and, and speed up uh, this uh, overall uh, initiative. Um, they're supposed to report back to us in, in a couple of years with a, uh, an overall plan but uh, that, that, I don't think that means that uh, the legislature is in stand down mode at all. And so uh, we're uh, clearly interested in participating, not just with the Climate Action Council, but also with the administration, which has been uh, under this governor has really been aggressively on the right side of this issue. Uh, I should also just while we're here, I'd like to just point out at the other, at the north boundary of our state is uh, the, another state, the province of Quebec. Uh, Hydro-Quebec uh, is something that I'm interested in. Unfortunately, with the pandemic, uh, the border has been closed. Uh, it'll still be closed for a while, but I would love to visit Hydro-Quebec and talk with some of the uh, people in the, prov in, in, in the province of, of Quebec uh, to learn more about the possibility of, of uh, transmitting power, uh, hydropower uh, into New York. Uh, I know that this is something that I sort of been looking at. Um, I'd like to learn more about it uh, for uh, all practical purposes. Uh, that is uh, the other bookend, if you will, of the state. Offshore power on the south side of the state, hydropower to the north, um, huge resources. 
uh, available for, in the case of Hydro-Quebec, for generating uh, green hydrogen, splitting water, uh, taking the hydrogen and then burning the hydrogen to create water vapor instead of burning carbon fuels to make carbon dioxide. Uh, if you uh, burn hydrogen or combine, recombine it with oxygen, all you end up with is water. And there's such a vast amount of hydropower available in Quebec that uh, that energy source, I think, is, is really worthy of our, our taking a look at it uh, uh, for uh, the future as well. Uh, all in all, I think we have, uh, through the work of our advocate base, I just want to say thank you uh, to all of the advocates who are on, on the line here uh, for uh, making it possible for us to advance our work at the legislative side of, uh, of the process uh, that much more efficiently and effectively. Um, we, we need to continue to do that. I, I look forward to continuing to work with you. Um, I'll end on uh, my opening comments here, be available for, for questions, of course, but I, I just want to make the observation that the Bond Act um, was an exercise in optimism this year uh, that, <laughs> that didn't uh, pan out, uh, but we need that Bond Act uh, for all of the obvious reasons uh, that we've been talking about. We, we really need to make uh, infrastructure improvements uh, if we're going to attack uh, the, uh, the, the question of transportation, the largest uh, sector really uh, in the state generating greenhouse gas emission, it, it, we're going to have to make some investments into um, recharging stations and uh, we're going to need the Bond Act. We're going to need to, to uh, take advantage of the opportunity that the Bond Act presents, which is public education. And so I'd like to see that Bond Act brought back. Uh, the attention of the public this year was uh, distracted powerfully and, and awfully by the pandemic. Uh, and so the governor, I think wisely, um, uh, pulled that uh, uh, back and, and did not put it before the voters this year, but it needs to happen. And it's something that, uh, again, we're going to have to work together to make happen. Uh, I say work together at the legislative and administrative and advocate uh, levels all together. So thank you for this opportunity to make a few comments. Uh, look forward to working with all of you as we go forward. Thank, thank you so much, Assemblyman. Appreciate it. And for those of you who may not be familiar, um, there was the potential, and we were very close this year, of a $3 billion Environmental Bond Act being put on the ballot uh, as a referendum for your vote. Uh, due to the COVID crisis and then the fiscal crisis that ensued, that was pulled from the ballot. And with the Assemblyman, and I know the Senator, and I know that Julie Ty and Joe and I uh, support for next year is putting it back on the ballot so we can move the needle on protecting our environment, fighting climate change and making communities more resilient uh, to sea level rise. So on that note, um, let's take a couple minutes and hear from Julie Ty from the League Conservation Voters. Julie? Great, I, I will be brief. Thank you to the Senator and Assemblyman for discussing sort of all the important things that we're doing by statute on, on climate. Um, you know, we know that offshore wind uh, is gonna play a huge part and renewable energy writ large as the foundation of how we're going to transform our economy to a clean energy economy. So it's really important that all of these actions happen now. Um, and that's something that is, as Doreen described, NYSERDA is advancing with projects in, uh, in Long Island, uh, in particular for offshore wind. Um, and they're looking right now at the Great Lakes as another opportunity for having offshore wind, which we think is something that's really critical to take a look at all of our options for offshore wind, taking in, into consideration the concerns that fishermen have and protecting the, the habitat, but really looking at how we can move our entire economy off of fossil fuel power and onto renewable energy. And the, one of the reasons why 
um, leaders like Assemblyman Engelbright and Senator Kaminsky and the governor take action is because so many of us are reaching out as citizens and as organizations to make sure that they know that this is important from a policy perspective and their leadership has gotten into us into a great place where industry knows that they're, that they're desired here. Um, now we need to also make sure that projects actually get done. Um, and that's making sure that we're weighing in, not just at the state level, at the big picture policy level, but also making sure that people are, are motivated and are, are talking to um, their local officials as projects are moving through the process and making sure that people know that people are out there in favor of projects because very often um, we, and I knew this when I worked at the Department of Environmental Conservation, groups would only come out and say they oppose something. It was very easy to, to, for people to wrap their arms around and saying no, but getting people to yes is just as important right now, right? We know that we need renewable energy in order to meet these goals. But if we don't, if we don't, if we only have these goals on paper and we don't actually have wind turbines turning, then it doesn't do us any good. And connected to our grid, which the assemblyman described so thoughtfully the, how much challenge we have on that end. So I, I want to encourage everybody that we need to be out there and we need to be vocal in support of projects um, so that we make sure that we can actually achieve those goals. So with that, I will, I will yield my time. <laughs> yes. Well, and last, but thank you, Julie. Uh, last but not least, just a couple of comments from Joe, and then we're going to take a bunch of questions. Uh, Joe, as I said, is the director of the New York uh, Offshore Wind Alliance. So, Joe, and you have to unmute yourself, she said once more. Yeah, I just wanted you to say it one more time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Adrian, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's nice to see you all virtually, uh, particularly the assemblyman and the, the senator. Um, uh, I, I want to take my time to just one tip my hat to both the Assemblyman Engelbright and Senator Kaminsky and also to uh, Doreen and the staff at NYSERDA. Um, you know, what's happened in the last few years in New York is legendary. Uh, I've been around the New York scene uh, for a long, long time, as many of you know, in a, in a variety of different capacities. And I've never seen the type of uh, proactive action and concerted effort to address a massive problem, which many of you have alluded to, which is climate change, um, and have New York, you know, once again, grab the mantle of leadership on a national level. Uh, the CLCPA is landmark legislation. Um, everyone knew as soon as that law was passed, that unless we were able to accelerate the pace at which we actually built projects, we could never achieve any of the goals there. So what does the legislature and the governor do? They got right back at the table just a few short months later and enacted a new siting law, and which also addressed transmission issues and accelerated the process for under Article 7 of the Public Service Law. Sweeping legislation, it addressed uh, environmental justice issues. It set up all of these councils in order to tackle the difficult problems we're going to have. We are going to have to tackle to get not only 70 by 30, but a, a 100 by 2040. So, uh, you know, again, my hats off to everybody that worked on this, and obviously the advocacy world of which the New York Offshore Wind Alliance is part of was, you know, part of that overall effort. So, I've tipped my hat to NYLCB and Adrian and others. Now, um, I know today's focus is on offshore wind, which is music to my ears coming from the New York Offshore Wind Alliance. And I'll just restate one of the things that I like to keep throwing out because it's really important to remember is that that 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind will be providing 30% of the state's electricity load by 2030 and then by 2035. So if we are going to meet the targets of the CLCPA, we have to meet the targets of offshore wind. And the state has set the table for that. As Doreen pointed out, we have three projects that are under contract and moving forward. The South Fork project, while it's relatively small, is incredibly important for the Long Island grid. And remember that it won a technology neutral competition on Long Island. It competed against fossil fuel 
projects. It competed against transmission lines and it won the competition because it addressed a whole variety of needs for Long Island system. And the other two projects, uh, Empire Wind and Sunrise Wind, Sunrise Wind are following in its heels. But as Senator Kaminsky pointed out, we are totally reliant on the federal government for both the permitting and to set up new wind energy areas so that we can increase the number of projects and increase the competition for future projects and help drive the cost down. Now, having said all this, uh, there are lots of formidable challenges. And as we get closer to building these projects, there will be more concerns about offshore wind. And we've heard concerns from, unfortunately, our president about you know the uh, wind turbines being a Cousinart that kill lots of birds. Uh, we hear about the uh, impacts of you know, uh, electromagnetic radiation. I can tell you that the full force of the environmental community, of the research community, is all focused on those problems and we are solving them as, you, as we speak. Uh, the issues of birds and bats, of uh, sighting in generally so that existing industries can co coexist in the ocean. Uh, we are not trying to shut down commercial fishermen off Long Island or any place off the East Coast. But keep in mind that in Europe, there's over 4,000 turbines spinning in 92 wind farms, and there may be more now. They are so, so rapidly developed that have been in operation for years in Europe, and they are developing even more aggressively over there. They can do it, we can certainly do it, and it is out of necessity. So I'm gonna stop preaching to the choir there because I know that uh, most of you are well-versed in, uh, in all the particulars of offshore wind, but, and I think now, Adrian, we'd like to get to the, uh, the question and answers that all of you have while we still have both um, Senator Kaminsky and Assemblyman Engelbright on the line. Yes, yeah, so, you know, Thank you very much, Joe and Julie. Um, the bottom line for everybody, and, and some folks are on the phone or on the call right now, Joe, who are maybe not familiar with this, but look, you know, we are at the great precipice of change. And I don't say that to be dramatic, but we are. We're at the great fork in the road right now. And we're either going to take the path of clean, safe, renewable energy and develop offshore wind, whether it's in the Great Lakes or on Long Island, we're going to develop large scale and community solar and residential solar. We're going to look at and take advantage of excess uh, Hydro-Quebec power. Uh, we, we need to do it all, right? Because we need to transition away from fossil fuels towards a sustainable renewable energy future. And we're making decisions right now. And I think if I had nothing, uh, if you remember nothing else, we need your help. And as Julie was saying, we need the public to speak up and speak out because there are those who are gravely misinformed uh, about wind and are ma literally making things up as I've seen on the East End. And I know we have some of the East End folks are on here today. Um, and, you know, we have to battle myths with facts, and we like to say good science and good pol and uh, good common sense yield good policy, and that's what we have to do. So one of the questions I'm getting in the chat uh, privately is, um, how can we accommodate uh, offshore wind and migratory pathways for um, whales? So, um, I don't know, Joe or Julie, whoever, you want to take that question? Well, I'm, I'm happy to start the, uh, the discussion and maybe Adrian will pipe in. But, you know, New York has taken a very proactive uh, stance in addressing not just uh, whales, but virtually every environmental concern. In the first solicitation the state put out, they established... Um, the, what are called technical working groups. And we have one, an environmental technical working group, and we have a maritime technical working group and a fisheries technical working group. And they started again from, you know, two years ago. And it is developers, uh, environmental, uh, non-governmental organizations, and other state officials all involved in a discussion about what developing, what are the best practices to avoid these conflicts with both commercial fisheries, with marine mammals, with birds and bats. So you have 
the all the stakeholders at the table literally working on the uh, the the you know the the knit and grit of getting to the the solutions to these prop to the to the issues and I'm not going to call them problems there there is an acknowledged you know impact no matter what you do especially on the scale that we're talking about offshore wind in New York but there are ways to minimize the problem and avoid it frankly um, you know the the first and most advanced commercial wind farm in the U.S. the Vineyard Wind Project off of the Massachusetts coast. They entered into an agreement with several environmental organizations for a protocol on how to deal with marine mammals. That those discussions are happening on every single project, whether it's the South Fork Project, Sunrise, or Empire. Those discussions are happening, and I will make a prediction now, since we're at the end of the year, is there will be a lot more agreements on exactly what the best protocol is. And it involves, you know, not operating at certain times when the whales are in migration. It, it requires observers to be present, you know, 24 seven to watch out for whales. It'll, it will involve acoustic monitoring to, you know, uh, find out when whales are in the vicinity. Uh, it will involve ship speeds. I mean, there is a long laundry list of things that can be done again, to avoid and minimize any impacts to not just marine whales, but any natural resource out there in the ocean. And maybe Adrian, can I answer that? Yes, please. So, um, you know, the technology for a lot of the, the detection is now amazing. You know, it used to be literally a person with binoculars looking out. Now, between drone technology and other infrared monitoring, it, it's getting more precise. But I just want, obviously, everybody to remember that the worst thing we can have for our sea life, especially our mammals, are the seismic blasts and drilling that are associated with fossil fuel exploration. So, you know, the more the more wind energy we bring on, the less we're going to have the giant blasts that really are paralyzing. Um, you know, I remember Assemblyman Engelbright, you know, showing me the results that are really staggering numbers of what it means to to uh, you know, whales that that are or dolphins that are in the path of the, the seismic blast. So, just something to keep in mind. No, I think that's an excellent point because people have to. Re we all have to remember it's not wind or nothing. It's wind or fossil fuels. So, two great challenges to marine species, but also birds, is climate change. So, when we mitigate climate change because we've diminished fossil fuels, or hopefully in New York get rid of them, uh, but globally diminish them then we've fought climate change and we help marine species, we help birds. And another great threat, and we've all seen it, um, to marine mammals is oil spills and oil drilling, you know, gone bad. And that has had a devastating impact on estuarine systems, ocean systems, uh, and all of the wildlife that depends on those ecosystems. So there are always choices to be made. We tell it like it is here at CCE, all energy infrastructure has some impact on the environment, but it's our responsibility to choose the infrastructure with the least impact. And that is renewables. We're not saying they're perfect. They're not perfect, but they are way more uh, better and uh, less impacting than clearly fossil fuels and even nuclear. Okay, um, this one I think is for our friends at Naserta. Why are the targets specific to offshore wind what does that mean for onshore wind development? Sure, happy to take that. And uh, so um, greetings everyone, I'm Adrian Downey. So we've got uh, the, the fortunate circumstance of two Adrians on a call today. What could um, be better than one Adrian, only two Adrian. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So um, Doreen, uh, Doreen has, uh, as she mentioned, had to leave, um, but happy to fill in here. Um, so I'm the, I'm the principal engineer for offshore wind and, uh, and help to lead uh, this program directly and happy to take the question. So, I mean, certainly um, as we've heard from, uh, from Doreen, from Senators um, you know, Kaminsky and then Assemblyman Eng Engelbright, you know, the, the CLCPA is, is really comprehensive in its view for renewable energy technologies and how, you know, we are approaching um, our clean energy future with, a, with an all-hands-on-deck uh, approach. We have specific targets for offshore wind of 9,000 megawatts by 2035. Um, we have specific onshore targets for specific technologies such as solar with 6,000 megawatts of solar technology um, anticipated by 20. 
2030, and 3,000 megawatts of storage, uh, as an example, by, uh, by the same uh, time frame, by 2030. Uh, for onshore wind, there is not a specific target, um, but it is understood that as, as we look to fulfill the clean energy standard, you know, it's a balance of, of um, providing very clear signals um, towards future development of renewables that we are eager for a clean energy future. Um, but there are specific technologies that we know need, need an, an additional push um, that are in, in a relative uh, stage of either infancy or earlier development, um, looking particularly at, at offshore wind. You know, this is brand new to the United States. It's brand new to New York. So it needs a special uh, push in order to offer, you know, what is a really strong signal to the market. And when we do that, um, we are able to advertise, you know, that, nice, that, that New York is, is clearly open for business for clean energy technologies, but that we are eager to, um, to build, you know, an economic future surrounding a future industry. And we look to, you know, our colleagues, um, you know, in, in uh, uh, certainly in the environmental sector, but in organized labor, um, in the supply chain development, you know, it's really an economic development play just as much as it is a clean energy play uh, for the state. Um, and, and we are best poised to do that if we offer uh, very strong and very clear signals um, to the market. And so we're saying, you know, New York is open for business. We are committed to a clean energy future. We are eager to set up um, or to see localization of what is literally a global supply chain um, in helping to drive investments in our economy, but we're also trying to offer a clear signal, you know, to local businesses to say, hey, there is a strong commitment to this, uh, this, this future market um, and growth and the state is behind you. It is committing to uh, make this happen in a way that will offer the certitude to, again, a workforce that, uh, that is strong but needs development. You know, if you wanna say, hey, I'd really love to train for an offshore wind job, you wanna know that you have a future. You know, what is my job gonna be in 2040? We can reliably say we've got one for you. Can I, can I just add to that? I, I think it's... It's um, the state has clearly demonstrated a commitment to uh, to offshore, not just offshore wind, but also onshore resources and solar with the legislation that Joe Martens talked about. Right. Mm -hmm. We had been going through a process that was moving too slowly. It wasn't enabling us to to get on the path to meet these these objectives of 70 percent renewable energy and 100 percent clean energy in the time frames we're talking about, because we're talking about a very short time frame. Um, and so by acting and adopting this Accelerated Renewable Energy Growth and Community Benefits Act, which is quite a mouthful, um, you know, they have demonstrated the, 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 that we are committed to making all, you know, onshore wind and solar energy something that moves at, at utility scale uh, in a more expeditious manner. So I think that demonstrates the state's commitment. And again, I want to reiterate how important it is for us to all get out and support projects when they're happening on the ground, because for us to meet these goals will require cooperation from the state, from the locals, from communities. And for the very reasons that you talked about, not just for the renewable energy benefits, but, and, and obviously the environmental benefits associated with moving off of fossil fuels, but for the economic and community benefits uh, of creating new jobs. But, but if you do want to kill a project, there's no better showstopper than Adrian to speak at your event. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I take that as a compliment. <laughs> I've, I've seen it. I've seen it. <laughs> I, am, I am rather good. Um, so here's the bottom line, right? We have three offshore wind uh, proposals already uh, off of the coast of Long Island. Well, two off of Long Island, one off of New York City and half of Long Island. Uh, and several more will be announced by the end of the year or beginning of the new year, um, as Nysirta said. So we have significant offshore wind projects that will be advancing. We need the public support. Uh, the local elected officials are going to need your support also. Look at what's happening in East Hampton. Uh, although this is a, a big project, the cable connection route has to go into East Hampton, which means the town plays a significant role in permitting the cable route to be connected. And so a dust up with some locals, um, just a few, but they're well-funded because, you know, it's East Hampton, um, you know, with some myths and misinformation, 
cause the town, you know, to have to take a longer process and spend more money doing research than was probably necessary, frankly. So we need for our local elected officials to know we support them. Don't get me wrong. I'm saying every project needs to have a site specific, rigorous environmental review. Uh, we want that. We need that. We want good projects. We want to pave the path uh, in a good way, but we can do that. And we need to do it based on science, not based on myths. So um, all of that is extremely important. And these cable connections, you will hear more about them. You probably, or maybe you don't know, but Sunrise Wind, the 880 megawatts, is proposing right now a preferred cable connection into Smiths Point County Park, and then coming up via the William Floyd Parkway, and the cable would has, to, has to weave its way to Holbrook. They have only certain places they can connect to because there's so many, uh, only so many substations, as Assemblyman Engelbright was alluding to uh, on Long Island, that can take in that level of power. So there are some limitations with our existing infrastructure that need to be taken under consideration too. It's not like they can just plug the cable in anywhere. It's like your house. You can only plug the plug in where the outlet exists. And the same is true for these offshore wind projects. So, um, okay, Michael Hansen saying local officials need to hear you and they need to know you support uh, renewable energy. So couldn't agree more with that. And since I'm seeing no other comments uh, and questions and it's exactly one o'clock, I think, um, wait, let me just see. I'm getting text messages about questions. Oh, the last one is, can we move the federal government forward? I honestly, some of you might know, but we've had some very unfortunate struggles over the last couple of years, having the federal government identify the wind energy areas, as they're called, off of the South Shore of Long Island. We're hopeful uh, that the new administration, and we've already received signs that the new administration will be looking towards advanced, advancing uh, offshore wind and uh, will be working to get those wind areas uh, identified and facilitated in a timely manner. Joe, did you want to chime in about that? I saw you. Um, I think the Biden administration is going to be much more renewable energy friendly period. So I will give him, uh, we'll give him a little time after he's installed on the 20th, but I'm, I'm very optimistic that the Biden administration is gonna be much more friendly to offshore and all renewables, period. All right, I'm giving them to the 25th. And we-, we, um, we I actually, know you'll be tough. We actually worked uh, together with Climate Jobs New York uh, with Congresswoman Rice, who coordinated a letter to Bohm asking them to do just this. So I think that's something we can easily re-up, but I, I agree uh, we will have a much easier time, I think, with uh, the new administration. Yes. All right. So we're we're uh, we're appointing all of you as wind warriors, and uh, we need your help. We need your voice. We need you. To, we will call upon you when we know that um, projects need visible or verbal support um, to elected officials from constituents. Because honestly, the public's voice matters. There wouldn't be a Climate Protection Act without the public's voice. There wouldn't be a, a transition away from fossil fuels without the public's voice. So your voice matters. It makes change. And that is how we, you know, we move, the, uh, move ourselves forward in society. So I want to thank all of you for your participation. Thank you so much to Senator Kaminsky, to uh, the folks at NYSERDA, both Doreen and Adrian, Assemblyman Engelbright, uh, Joe Martens and Julie Tai, and all of you for participating. We appreciate it. And we'll let you know when the next one is. Signing Thanks, off. Thanks, Adrian. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.